आज हम साउथ एशिया की एक बहुत बड़ी ट्रेजिडी को याद कर रहे हैं 16 दिसंबर 1971 जब बंगालियों ने अपना देश अलग किया बांग्लादेश के नाम से पाकिस्तान से अलग हुए क्योंकि पाकिस्तान की आर्मी ने जुल्मो सितम के पहाड़ डहा दिए और दुनिया की हिस्ट्री पर जुल्मो बरबरीत का एक खौफनाक बाब लिखा गया अकवा मतदा के मद टंग दे से लेकर जुल्मो जबर की जो दास्तान रकम हुई पाकिस्तान की आर्मी की अपने ही हम मजहब और अपने ही उस वक्त के हम वतन बहन भाइयों के साथ जो जुल्म हुआ वो तारीख का एक स्या बाब है और मेरे साथ इस वक्त दो बंगाली इंग्लैंड से जुड़े हुए हैं एक स्काई पर वेल नून ऑथर हैं प्रिया जी देव सरकार जी और उनके साथ साथ हैं इमरान चौधरी साहब जो बांग्लादेश से हैं ही इज़ लिविंग इन इंग्लैंड फॉर अ लॉन्ग टाइम ही हैपन टू सर्व बांग्लादेश आर्म फोर्सेस वेलकम बोथ ऑफ यू आल स्टार्ट विद आल स्टार्ट विद यू इमरान साहब यू आर इलेवन ईयर ओल्ड वेन यू सो ऑल दोज एट्रॉसिटीज नॉट जस्ट एट्रॉसिटीज you happen to uh, went through everything your brother sacrificed uh, his life so what what was the uh, i witness counter of those horrible days uh, thank you thanks for having me in your show it is a pleasure and an honor to speak to you all the way from london and thanks for uh, taking the interview on a subject uh, which is very close to my heart uh, i mean whatever you see in me today is uh, basically a, pro- a produce of 1971 um basically we i was uh, 10 years old when the war unfolded on the 25th of march 1971 at the time we were living about 100 kilometers away from dhaka the capital city a small town known as brahmin baria means it was the place perhaps where the home for all the brahmins so i was a student of class 6 at the time and uh, the liberation war unfolded my father was posted with the east pakistan rifles which was the border security force equivalent of bsf border security force of india in silet which is the north in distant district of bidhan east pakistan bordering assam meghalaya and tripura and um, my father actually was the first officer to revolt in silet division on the 27th of march 1971 at 9:15 he ambushed a convoy of pakistan army which was commanded by captain gulam rasool and in that ambush captain gulam rasool and 21 of them were captured live and they were arrested and they were at a later stage about 2 uh, months later they were handed over to uh, the indian authorities now from then we got completely displaced we had no communication with my father and then the common barrier remained a, a a safe city till the 17th of april uh, from 25th of march till the 17th of april on the 17th of april at about 4:30 in the afternoon uh, three sabotages planes came and pounded the city for more than 45 minutes and that was the biggest surprise of my life i have never heard so much of noise which is the planes were literally flying not more than 500 years on top of my head so we went into a shelter we made some bunkers but it was full of water because you know the monsoon kicked in in, in april in bangladesh so every trenches every ditches that you can see this were all full of water so we came out of the trench and went and dipped into the pond and we stayed in a pond for 40 minutes and uh, it was near that experience every couple of seconds the bombardment were happening in discriminate firing of a uh, uh, huge massive bullets were littered all around us we were very close to the um, the the brahmanbaria tita 
of gas uh, in Australia. This was the first natural gas found in Bidhan East Pakistan, which was literally two and a half miles away from my grandfather's house. So about say five five fifteen, uh, the, the 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 planes left, and then there was a huge rumor in the town that the Pakistan army is actually attacking the town, enveloping it from two sides, south and the north. And um, I was in my wet clothes from the pond, and my mum just told us, grab whatever you can and let's get out of this place. And we just moved. We just left the house. Whatever we had, everything living in the house, we just left. And bear in mind that house is a three-generation old house of my family. So literally we left everything and we started running and running and running and running. Trust me, I don't know how long I ran for. It was like thousands of people, the biggest exodus I have ever seen in my life. I had two younger brothers. My younger brother was, uh, one was eight, I was 10, and the other one was six. And I was holding one of my brother in my hand. My elder brother was helping my mom and my sister. We don't know how long we ran for. Uh, I think it was dusk around 7, 7.30. We stopped in a village. Um, the name of the village is called Pakachong. I still remember the name. Anyway, then we, within the, the first night we stayed, we found a, a, a place to stay in a house, quite an affluent house, and there were like 60, 70 people already entered that house before we did. So we ended up staying in the, in the cow shed for the first night from the pristine, neat and clean bed sheets to a cow dunk ridden sleeping on the uh, to what you call the straws, and that was the first night. And then we went from one village to the other, to the other, to the other, and no villages were ready to accept us because we didn't fit in, we didn't gel in with them. We were speaking in a different accent. We, my mother was a teacher, she was a graduate in 1956, and she was telling us words in English, so people started to think either we are Biharis or we are Punjabis. And they became quite antagonized that we are not going to shelter you because we don't think you are Bengalis. So you're like you are a stranger in your own country. So my brother was a 17 year old. He then, we stayed from one village to the other to the other. It passed like from the 17th of April till the 30th of April. We went from one village to the other. Everywhere we went, we seek shelter. Meanwhile, whatever gold and whatever money my mother had, we almost sold everything just to get some cash, to buy some food and stay somewhere. So then my brother came out with the idea that let's go to India because he heard in India is giving us shelter. Here I will interrupt you, Imran sir. Uh, we'll, we'll resume this story uh, I want to take some comments from Priyajit as well. Uh, so, so we'll go from there. Uh, what you just said that uh, you went to a state when you uh, and your family decided to go to India. So Priyajit, as Bengali, now living in England, what are your, what were actually your observations at the time? You must be a child at the time. Uh, how would you like to conduct this debate uh, according to your experience and observations regarding this terrible, terrible tragedy? Uh, thank you very much for, us, uh, for giving me the opportunity. Uh, um, uh, so uh, as, as, uh, as you said, I have written a book on East Pakistan, so it is the, it's called The Last Raja of West Pakistan. So that analyzes the geopolitical and the dynamics of the region. Now, uh, whenever I say this, I always like to point out that why did it come to the point uh, in March 1971 that uh, the 54% of the Pakistani population, so, so the majority of a country wanted to break away from the minority. We need to understand this fact. 
that what we see today in the geographical uh, space of Pakistan, which is called West Pakistan, it only represented around um, 45% of its uh, population in the year 1971. Um, so uh, if, if we go back in history a bit, uh, if you remember, you know, when Pakistan was formed, uh, uh, the founding father of Pakistan, Mr. Jinnah, he and and uh, Mr. the first prime minister, Mr. Liaquat Ali Khan, they introduced this first 12 point, you know, the objective resolution. So I think that was the first nail in the coffin of the, you know, the land of the pure. Um, and then it started. So first they introduced uh, saying that Urdu and Urdu shall only be the language of the entire of Pakistan. Now, that is to say, again, like, you know, 10 percent of the people speaking a language which was actually from India, though, by the way, it was not anything to do with Punjab or the, you know, the elite of that region uh, of five rivers. Um, and they decided that we will impose this language uh, throughout Pakistan, where uh, the 55 percent of the population in the eastern wing, they were speaking Bengali, which was, you know, they're speaking and, and you know, living the culture together for the last 5,000 years. So the Bengali culture is something that uh, is, 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 is far uh, different uh, and far unique compared to the religious be beliefs. So even today we have got Christian Buddhists, uh, Hindus and Muslims, all the different sects in the Indian subcontinent. They can still speak Bengali and you know, they can have shared them culture. But there might be slight differences. Generally speaking, I think um, that was the notion in Bengal. So when they started this, uh, the language movement, so I think in, in, in the world history, and um, I don't find another example, I might be wrong, but I haven't found it yet, is that one uh, sect of people have sacrificed so much for the love of their mother tongue. And that's why, you know, on 21st February, there was a military crackdown in East Pakistan, in where uh, the students and ordinary people revolted against the West Punjabi Pakistani, the military elite, which is the deep state establishment, to say that, you know, we reject this Urdu and we, we will speak our language and we will want we want Bengali as one of the official languages of Pakistan. And in rightly so, it, it, because you see Pakistan consisted of various fragmenting units like, you know, and like the Pashtuns in the north and probably the Baluch uh, in the south, and you know the the Mahajirs, you know who were who were actually from India. They speak a different language. And then you got you know a lot of other different communities within uh, the majority of Pakistan. So we got the Shias, the Ahmadis, the Ismailis, the Boras. So the so Pakistan was like a, you know a collection of you know all different sects and different um, people with different culture, cultural and ethnic identity. So I think it started with the objective resolution and the uh, the language movement, and then, as as you are aware, Gurasab, you know, uh, in 1960s we had the great dictator, uh, the so-called field marshal, who I don't think you can get a field marshal title without winning a war. However, I think for Pakistan, some different sets of standards apply, which can every, every country has. I'm going to interrupt here, Priyaji. Yeah. Whatever you yeah. are shedding, your, uh, um, shedding the light on history, absolutely yeah. fine, absolutely correct. But the thing is, I'm more focused today on the kind of uh, observations and the kind of the um, sort of uh, uh, implications of that horrible tragedy in, in our part of the world. I'll go back to uh, Imran Chaudhary and then Again, I'll take you, uh, Priya Jiji. In Imran Chaudhary Sahab, uh, you wrote on your blog that you were 11 year old, uh, 10 and 11 year old, and your brother was 70 and old at the time, and he joined Freedom uh, Fighters. And uh, I interrupted you about a couple minutes ago when you, you and your family decided to. Uh, enter into India. So I, I like to resume a little more story as much as brief uh, possibly you could uh, give your observation of that time. Please. Winning seats in the in the 
all of the Pakistan uh, parliament. So we wanted a power sharing government, but they didn't want to do that. So they cracked down on the 25th of March. And guess what? In one night, they have killed 7,000 people whilst they were in sleep in Dhaka town. They raped thousands of girls and women from the various medical colleges, the women's hostels, universities, and from hospitals and everywhere. So the fear of the death that I was running from Brahmanbaria to the villages, it's very confusing. This is something that I always, uh, always, always think about it on my own. I mean, we could hear the Pakistan army shouting, Yahoo, Allahu Akbar, Ya Ali, and all that. And we were saying, La ilaha illanta subhanaka inni kuntu min azwali min. It's a verse from the Quran, and it says that if you keep on uttering this, then God and Allah rescues you. And Moses, Musa alayhi was rescued from the from the belly of a fish when he was in, he was eaten up, and he was saved from there. So then I just wondered, as a ten year old. Why is this happening? He is also shouting the same God's name and I'm also shouting the same God's name to rescue me and he is shouting blessings from God to kill me. How does that work? So then we pour into India, it's Hindu India. Um, my family was part of Calcutta before the independence of Pakistan, partition of India, partition of India in 1947. We went back to India uh, with a lot of trepidation, a lot of uh, reservation, a lot of fear in us. So we poured into India and guess what? When my Muslim Pakistanis were killing me, Muslim Bengalis, we went to Hindu Bengalis in India, in Tripura district, uh, in Tripura uh, province of India, and these people of Tripura embraced us with their open arm and gave us shelter, gave us food, gave us clothing, gave us utensils, even gave one of their rooms to stay. And then I realized, I think, it is not religion, it is humanity that triumphs over everything. And since then onwards, I have always been working to create an interfaith cohesion and work to have multi-faith cohesion amongst all the religions in the world. Because I, I had India not given me shelter in 1971, had India not given the Bangladeshi freedom fighters, the training, the arms, the ammunition, the logistics and everything, I would have been killed like my brother perhaps, or maybe if we stayed inside East Pakistan, they would have hunted us down because every village as we went, every other village had been raided by Pakistan army and just searching for people from the towns and we were like conspicuous, very, we were just stuck like a sore thumb in the, almost all the villages and they would have picked us up, picked us up and killed us. But I, I still have a lot of homage and a lot of respect to the villages who really, really sheltered us, you know, at the detriment of their own lives. I'm indebted to them so much. You so said you are indebted to them so much. much. Here I will take Priyajit. Priyajit. Mm -hmm. What Imran uh, Chaudhary said that unfortunately the people who were chanting the same religious prayers were killing Bengalis who belong to the same religion. So now Priyaji moving forward fast. In our times very recently Indian government has passed CAP, Citizenship Amendment Bill. So, so what do you think, think after 1971, jumping and moving fast forward to our today's reality, what do you think, what would be the impact of India's new bill to Bengalis? And thank you very much. I just want to point out one more thing, like uh, from my previous uh, session, is that, see, the, when uh, Ibrahim was saying it's the same, people killing you know each other and i think that uh, is continuing till today as we speak so if we take the geography of pakistan today i think 54 of it is baluchistan 
and the baluchis are uh, predominantly muslim so and we have the punjabi uh, establishment and the army actively you know involved in a genocide and you know and a campaign of rampage throughout the region of baluchistan so i think and and same goes with the pashtuns as well with the pashtun talk with movement as well which is you know going on where they're seeking their rights so it is not a question of religion it is just a question of who controls the power in pakistan and who calls the shots and who 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 actually you know own the country so the, from its day it was founded you know the 22 families or so which have evolved and the military you know elite they have an iron grip on the entire state and they and they hold the entire region hostage to their you know spread of hostilities to both uh, direct conflict and indirect you know non state act now coming to your question of uh, cab right. i would like to uh, i would like to draw your attention that in recent years you might have heard that there was a severe crisis in southeast asia which was the rohingya crisis which is a very you know active and a grave situation and i think uh, uh, bangladesh was in the front line of this but the other country which has stood out in this globally India has given Bangladesh and to the Rohingya refugees both in kind and you know in giving shelter is unparalleled. So I don't think that anything to do with a specific religion or a specific following or a specific language has got any impact on the greater picture of you know Southeast Asia because we have to remember that India is the motherland and all the other fragmenting units are connected via the umbilical cord to the you know the Indian subcontinent. So I think that uh, there is obviously some amount of politics which is there throughout the uh, you know global stage. But if we discount that bit, I think uh, it, what they have done is is I think which there are probably some you know deep seated reasons behind it, and um, I am sure there there will be ways for uh, the entire region to work together. And saying that, uh, what Bangladesh has achieved today if you look at this Bangladesh political setup and its position in the global economy in you know the global different kind of indexes of you know of developing nation i think the bangladesh government and the bangladesh people have done exceptionally well and and there is always a deep seeded and a very well calculated campaign to destabilize that Uh, the legitimate you know government and the uh, mandate of the people to to invoke those 1971 those anti secular or the anti liberation elements to negate the gains which were and the pain which was endured by people like you know Imran Chaudhary and his family and the Mukti Bhai and including the Indian armed forces because they laid down their lives you know in a in a foreign country where it was i think one of the just just war of you know the century so i really i really think that we must stand united and bangladesh is a very firm ally of india and as an example to the whole world as to um, what a country can achieve you know if they are taking the right decision so we should work together and i'm sure you know in a nation state uh, history and a long term friendship as one of the quotes from the bangladesh government they say like friendship is like a river it will flow so uh, we 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 should focus on the larger picture so, so imran choudhury sahab the thing is as you mentioned you and your family were greeted welcomed by indian villagers and they gave you everything they gave you hope for life so now you are england and you are seeing the world turning around sort of so in this situation as i ask uh, priyajit what do you think that how could this misunderstanding uh, between bangladesh and india could be resolved in the wake of this cab bill no 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 I, 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 well um, i'm not in bangladesh at the moment yeah i understand that but but you are from bangladesh uh, region i can assure you one thing uh, uh, bangladesh and india enjoys the best relation amongst all the neighboring countries 
countries of India and Bangladesh. By and large, we have the best relation. So what, what, what do you expect from Pakistan now? Because Pakistan, even today, is reluctant to apologize uh, Bengal. Let me, let, me, let me come back to Pakistan. Just give me one second, sure. if you may kindly, sir. Sure. sure. What, I'm, what I was trying to say to you about the India-Bangladesh relation is India-Bangladesh from the prism of 1971 and the shared history, the shared culture, shared uh, b b ethos and aspirations. This CAB is a, a temporary thing, and I'm sure India is a mature democracy. India is not going to uh, do uh, uh, something that which is going to upset her most reliable and trustworthy friend amongst all the other countries. Bangladesh, perhaps, is one of the most trustworthy friends of India, and so is India to Bangladesh. Now, about Pakistan, yes. Uh, I, 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 I promote a multicultural relation, multicultural uh, living in UK, uh, multi-faith, multicultural, multi-race, but uh, the, we, we, we live with Pakistanis, Bangladeshis, Indians, um, um, Somalians and all the other people in UK. And I don't want to have that acrimonious um, 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 feelings in me. I would rather build a bridge with Pakistan. But in order for me to build a bridge, I think the owner lies with Pakistan. We would love or we would certainly demand an atonement, a reparation, a financial reparation, and a moral reparation, and an unconditional apology for all the rapes, all the tortures, all the killings, all the subjugation, all the deracinations, and all the inhuman Nazi-like taken out from the leaf of Hitler's book, tried to annihilate the Bangladeshi race, depopulate East Pakistan, and they wanted to bring their own people so that they can have a captive East Pakistan with their own kind of breeding group, their own kind of people, so that no mass upsurge can take place and they can show the world that we have a two-nation theory. So basically, yes, we would like to have an atonement, we would like to have an unconditional apology, we would like a moral and fiscal reparation from Pakistan, yes. That's, that's the need of the hour. So Priyajit, what do you expect from Pakistan as Bengali? Well, I, I, I would I would say that as an Indian and as a resident in UK, as Mr. Uh, Chaudhary has rightly pointed out, we we stay together. And my aims and my hopes for Pakistan is very high. However, I don't know that if 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 that will if that is enough uh, for the other side to react. And um, it is again like as I said before, you know, the global hub of of all the uh, terrorism and you know all the activities of spreading hate and you know division originates from one place now um, if there is a, a policy of state sponsoring of terrorism it we, it becomes very hard uh, for the neighbors of, of that country you know to deal with the situation and when I talk about neighbors if you look at the neighbors, and uh, everybody is is not in a very favorable uh, relationship with the establishment. If you look at Afghanistan, if you look at Iran, even so, um, you, you can counter argue saying that uh, the 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 regime in India is 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 not favorable and they have an agenda. If you say that, I would counter argue to say that what about Afghanistan and Iran? Are are they are they also uh, for from a different you know uh, maybe. Uh, um, a religion or something that that is why they are uh, having an antagonistic view of Pakistan. No, they are not. But uh, the thing is that if you have this policy of you know promoting uh, somebody else's war and you know running this uh, military industrial complex uh, based on you know foreign funding and you know just to wage uh, a war kind of economy which survives and thrives on you know uh, as its uh, terrorism as its uh, exports, uh, and I think it becomes very difficult 
for the neighbors to work with it, even how much as we wish to work with it. Very so, so in the end, Imran Chaudhary uh, Sahab, I would like to know from you, after going through all hardships, after going through so much sufferings from your childhood, from your teenage, uh, until you guys settled after the independence of Bangladesh. So today, as you are living in England, and you must be visiting uh, Bangladesh on and off, I guess so. So where Bangladesh is today, uh, after so many years of independence, are you and your family and your relatives are happy that your forefathers, your ancestors fought that freedom uh, war and uh, got an independent state. So now you think that Bangladeshis are happy after getting independence from Pakistan? Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much, Imran uh, Bhai. You summed up so well, so beautifully. And right in the end, I would like to ask Priya Jeet, as an author, Priya Jeet, how would you like to sum up our today's debate in kind of a very short uh, and brief message? My message is that you know the two-nation theory, uh, which started in 1947, 
in essence, in geographical terms, it was the division of Bengal and Punjab, you know, if you take it alphabetically. These were the two provinces of the United India that were, you know, separated uh, due to a multitude of reasons. One of them being, you know, uh, the political party which uh, claimed to rest, uh, rest, uh, came to be the nomination of the entire, you know, the Muslim uh, community of the region, which is absurd because they, you know, very well they lost the election, and how could they become their sole representative? Anyway, the two nation theory sank to the bottom of Bay of Bengal on the 16th of December 1977. So it is, you know, it is buried there. And we need to move forward. We do not need. We, we do not wish to become slaves, and you know, throw, uh, you know, abuse or any kind of, you know, thing you. Of at each other. However, the terror must stop in order, you know, for friendship to, you know, uh, flow. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thank you very much both, both of you, and happy Independence, Independence Bangladesh Day. Thank you very much. We are honored and we're delighted to be um, talking to you. Thank you very much. Welcome. And viewers, you are watching Candid Talk with Imran Chaudhary and uh, Priyajit Dev Sarkar. And we were talking about that tragic day that happened on uh, December 16, 1971 for Pakistani's point of view. And a very happy Independence Day for my Bangladeshi brothers and sisters. And we'll be keep talking on those South Asian issues at TAC TV. Thank you for watching today's show.